right, ladies and gentlemen. So you are the uh, the conference warriors, the people who stay to the very end. So we are now going to uh, go on with session five, which is the last session of the morning. So I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Gaurav Lakampal. And we're, going, we're moving on now to deep venous disorder. So our first speaker is gonna be Dr. Fernando Lescas. He's going to try to teach us a little bit about the new SVP classification, God bless him, because uh, it's not a user-friendly system. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Um, I think I can only succeed after that, whatever happens, because it is very tough. But presenting a, a new classification system at 3 p.m. Is, is daunting. However, I will not bombard you with dense facts, but rather expose you to a new idea. I want to provide you with a primer to help you incorporate this classification system into your practices. And for, I have no disclosures. Many, if not all of you, will recognize the swoosh, the iconic and the most recognizable brand logo in the world of the company, Nike. In addition, just looking at this image generates thoughts of athleticism, conveying motion, speed, and symbolizing victory. Nike being the goddess of victory in Greek mythology. Whereas this group of letters and numbers may not convey to you any thoughts or emotions at all. The report, the report of this 3D volume rendered CTV movie loop of a woman with pain and pressure in her pelvis took me more than two pages to describe. However, I can convey the most salient findings of the pathology of the same with the same string of letters and numbers as the last slide. Logos in Greek means the word. In the broadest sense, it is the rationality of the human mind to attain understanding and harmony. In other words, bring order. This is an artistic representation of the Tower of Babel. The Bible tells us that after the great flood, all of humanity spoke the same language and wanted to build the tower to reach the heavens. But God, or possibly the chaotic universe, conspired against them and gave each group of workers a different language. Thereby, they could not communicate with each other and the tower was never built. Likewise, the state of pelvic venous disorders is in a state where different specialties speak different languages and cannot communicate adequately. Why? Because similar symptoms may arise from different underlying pathophysiology and similar underlying pathophysiology may give rise to different symptoms. Pelvic venous anatomy and interconnections are also complex. I use this schematic to simplify the main elements of the gonadal veins, the internal iliac branches, and the communication of the pelvic veins to the lower extremities. The SVP classification was published in 2021 by a cohort of international authors from different medical subspecialties to provide a uniform language for pelvic venous disorders. The classification seeks to define homogeneous patient groups. It facilitates clinical communication. It allows precisely directed treatment, helps in the development of patient reported outcome measures, and helps in the development of clinical trials. This instrument characterizes a patient's clinical presentation in terms of symptoms, signs, and underlying pathophysiology. The classification has three domains, symptoms, variceal reservoirs, pathophysiology, which is then in turn subdivided into anatomy, hemodynamic abnormalities, and etiology. The abdomen, pelvis, and upper portion of the lower extremities are divided into four anatomic zones. Zone one is the left renal vein, Zone two is the gonadal and internal iliac veins. Zone three is the pelvic origin, extra pelvic veins. And zone four is the upper lower extremities best described by SEEP. The 
symptoms in zone one include flank pain and hematuria. The varices are in the renal hilum. In zone two, the symptom is chronic pelvic pain and the varices are in the pelvis. Zone three includes vulvar and scrotal pain with venous claudication, and the varices are in the vulva or in the scrotum. Zone four, the symptoms and varices are best described by the hasty symptoms and SEEP. The location of the symptoms and varices are then given a, a number from one to three, going from crania to caudat direction. The three subdomains include laterality, so it is left, right, and bilateral. The anatomy is from the IVC to the um, pelvic origin, extra pelvic veins. The hemodynamics include obstruction and reflux, and the etiology is thrombotic, non-thrombotic, or congenital. Complete classification using this scoring sheet is done once diagnostic imaging studies are complete. The SVP instrument attempts to comprehensively describe a patient's clinical presentation by the nomenclature of SVP with the corresponding subscripts. AVLS has developed an app uh, with the leadership of Dr. Gasparis, if he's still here, uh, for the Android and Apple platform that can be downloaded at this site. They've just recently released a number of workbooks also. The app guides you to enter information into each of the domains and the subdomains, such as symptoms, varices, and so forth, to eventually give you the classification. So let's look at a few cases and try to classify them. The left renal vein compression syndrome involves a patency of the left renal vein in the angle formed between the aorta and the SMA. In the normal situation, the space in this angle is capacious. In the nutcracker syndrome, the angle is narrow, compressing the left renal vein. This is a case of a 22-year-old woman with left flank pain, microscopic hematuria, and progressive left lower quadrant pain. The axial CT demonstrates the renal vein compressed between the superior mesenteric artery, the arrow, and the aorta, the, and, and, and the uh, aorta. The sagittal image confirms the narrow angle and the tortuous varicosity on the coronal reformatted images indicates a varicose around the left ureter. The pelvic view of the CT shows pelvic varices. So let's score this. The symptoms are renal and pelvic. The varices include, um, the varices include, uh, let me get here, renal, pelvic. So, so far we have S12 and V12. Moving to the pathophysiology, there is involvement of the left renal vein, obstructive in nature, non-thrombotic, LRV, O, and T, and then moving down to the left gonadal vein, reflux in nature, non-thrombotic, to yield LGV, R, and T. This classification should be read like a sentence from left to right, so it would read S12, V12, P, LRV, O, and T. The different level of reflux is um, separated by a semicolon, LGV, R, and T. In the May Thurner syndrome, uh, there is compression of the left common iliac vein between the right common iliac artery and the anterior surface of the underlying vertebral body, resulting in left pelvic and lower extremity venous congestion. This is a case of a 45-year-old man who presented with acute left lower extremity pain, swelling, skin discoloration, following a long distance flight. The axial CT demonstrates narrowing of the left 
common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery. And the coronal reformatted image shows that there is thrombus in the left common iliac vein and external iliac vein. So let's, let's um, score this. There is leg symptoms are the varices, S3V. Uh, there are no varices. And then moving to the pathophysiology, the left common iliac vein shows obstruction, thrombotic. And then moving down, the left external iliac vein shows obstruction, thrombotic, again, giving you this long classification. The third and final case is that of escape varicosities in the thigh fed by an incompetent left obturator vein. The MRI of the, in the sagittal view demonstrates pelvic varicosities and a dilated obturator vein showing contrast flowing down into varicose veins in the medial aspect of the left upper thigh. A subselective catheterization of the left obturator vein shows contrast flowing from the obturator vein down to the varicosities in the leg. So let's score this and be patient here because this is gonna be long, but if you consider level by level, it kind of makes sense. Leg symptoms are present, S3B. Varicosities involve the pelvis and also leg varicosities. So that will be V2, 3B. And then we move to pathophysiology and think about the level of involvement. We have the left gonadal vein. It is reflux in nature, non-thrombotic. We also have the internal iliac vein, reflux, non-thrombotic. And finally, the pelvic origin, extrarenal veins, extra pelvic veins, excuse me, refluxing non-thrombotic. So we end up with this long string of letters and numbers which describe the leg symptoms, the location of the varices and the three levels of vein reflux. Remember that there are pelvic leak points from the internal iliac veins to the lower extremity veins, the inguinal point, the obturator point, the pudendal and the gluteal points through which these veins communicate from the pelvis into the lower extremities. So as Dr. Meissner puts it, the SVP classification terminology is complex. However, pelvic venous disorders are also complex. He recommends to refer to his manuscript over because it is very, hard to absorb all of it in a single reading or two, and also use the app. So what I've done in this presentation is try to give you the rationale why we need a classification. As well, I've given you details of the classification as well as scoring a few. And to conclude, I will wind up with a recommendation as far as how to incorporate this classification in your practices. Dr. Patrick Henry Winston is an engineer professor at MIT, and he posits that success is a function of three variables, in keeping with the terminology and the symbols, talent, which all of us have to some degree, knowledge, and I apologize for the shift, knowledge is the reason why we're all here, but most importantly, what you need to do to incorporate this into your practice is indeed practice, practice, practice. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Let's have a seat up here on the podium. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Eftemios Abigarinos again. He's speaking to us from Athens, Greece. His topic is how do I choose which venous stent to use? Here's the data. So Marcus, if you're still here. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter, again. And again, thank you for the kind invitation. It's a privilege to participate in the conference. Okay, these are my disclosures. So um, this is the wall stand, and this is the stand we have been using uh, five years ago. This was the only stand we had available, an arterial stand available in large sizes that we adapted 
uh, for, for the veins. And, and we adapted our needs to its uh, uh, weaknesses. Uh, force shortening, uh, inaccurate deployment, uh, weak radial force at its ends, uh, forcing us to extend it uh, into the vena cava. Uh, but despite that, long-term results have actually been good. And this is the Z stand, and we created a composite uh, configuration. And the, the main reason we have been using the Z stand as an extension of the wall stand was to prevent contralateral jailing uh, of the iliac vein and prevent contralateral DVT. Um, I have some issues in the uh, slides changing it. Okay, so uh, these are large series um, uh, coming from uh, US of uh, wall stents, uh, indicating the good results that we had actually uh, with these stents. Uh, this is a series from Paul Gagné, uh, 77 limbs that use the wall stent patency, 87%. 75% for post-thrombotic syndrome, 95% for nibbles. If you look at another series, the series from uh, Raju, uh, again, uh, patency rates 70% overall, 68% for post thrombotic syndrome, 74% uh, for nibbles. So, can we really make it better? We know that stents require intervention, and reintervention uh, uh, re relates to, to poor anatomy, to risk stenosis, and to anticoagulation. And unfortunately, a lot of the interventions we are seeing today uh, are because of bad techniques. The question today is, can stent type alter the outcomes? Venous standing is different from arterial standing. We have different nature of disease, different vessel diameters, different vessel flexion, different patient age, different flow dynamics. That's why nitinol was introduced. And nitinol is synonymous to flexibility, endurance, precision, and strength. This is what the new dedicated stents are. We have been using wall stent, as I said. We have the most clinical experience, but it had weaknesses. And the first stents that we got in US were the Venovo from BART and the Vici from Boston Scientific. Uh, more predictable deployment, higher uniform radial force, longer stents to avoid overlap. And then we got the Silver Vena and the Abre uh, from Cook and Medtronic respectively. And I can tell you in Europe, we have a lot more available and you may see them in US over the next few years. Optimum, Blue Flow plus Medica, Beyond from Bentley and uh, the duo that was recently bought from uh, Philips. And we already have recall of two stents. The Vici stent has been recalled because of high incidence of migration, which I think was related to user, uh, uh, to the users. And the Venovo, and the Vici is not coming back. The Venovo had some issues with the release and the deployment, but it's coming back within the next few months. So we have a variety of stents. We have open cell stents uh, like the Venovo, the Zelvervina, and the Abre that can uh, uh, provide flexibility and are potentially less prone to fracture. We have the closed cell stents uh, like the Vici provides better radial force. We have braided woven stents that are kind of closed cell like the wall stand and the blue flow, they provide good crash resistance and are also less prone to fracture. And we also have hybrid stents like the Duo and the Sinus Venus with potentially combined advantages. What we want from the Venus stents, we want them self-expandable with sufficient outward force. We want them to have equal crash resistance throughout, sufficient wall coverage, predictable deployment, minimal for shortening, flexibility, without king and durability. But we cannot really have all these characteristics. There are some trade-offs. If you want flexibility, you're gonna use, uh, you're gonna lose strength. If you want uh, accurate deployment, if you want to avoid for shortening, uh, you're gonna lose with scaffolding. You simply can't have these uh, characteristics simultaneously. And there's the story below the guinea ligament. We know that particularly the closed stents have a higher fracture rate. You can see the Vici, but I have personally seen fractures with all stents. I have seen with the Novo too. So what do we do? 
do we need a different stand for uh, a, any different location or should we be using hybrid stands? Should we uh, uh, get advice from the industry trials? Uh, can this tell us uh, which stand is better? Well, I don't think the industry trial can give us uh, any information because we are not comparing apples to apples. Uh, different primary endpoints, different uh, uh, assessment uh, techniques, uh, and uh, different populations. If you, if you look at the population of the different uh, trials, for example, the Neval population, uh, you can see the Virtus trial had 25% uh, Nevals. The vernacular trial had 45% Nevals. So you can say the vernacular trial had easier patients. Same with the standing length. Same with the below the guinea ligament standing. Vernacular trial, only 9% of the patients had extension below the guinea ligament, while the Abre trial, 44% of the patients had extension of the stand below the guinea ligament and they all had good results, but these are not similar populations to compare. Uh, the study from UK, from Steve Black, uh, puts some science into head-to-head -head comparisons between stents. Uh, they compared open cell stents against closed cell stents. The open cell have been the Abre and the Venovo and the Zilver. The closed cell has been the Vici. Well, they didn't find any difference in primary pregnancy at 12 months roughly 60%. But when they divided the stents or they subcategorized them for the below the guinea ligament extension, then it seems that the open cell stents do better. 52% uh, at two months patency for open cells, 40% patency for closed cells. However, this was not significant or it was a trend towards significance. And when they tried to identify factors relating to patency, uh, the stent was not a predictor. The main predictor was inflow. Similar study done uh, in Netherlands from Cis Widens. They compared rigid stents, and rigid stents were the sinus uh, and the Vici against the flexible stents like the sinus venous and the silver. And they found that flexible stents seem to have better patency at 12 months, 90% against 80% for the rigid stents. But again, this was not statistically significant. I have some delay in the change of slides. So, um, Here's data, uh, a very recent systematic review comparing dedicated against non-dedicated uh, uh, stents for post-thrombotic syndrome, one year patency, 76% for dedicated stents, 79% for uh, non-dedicated stents. And if you look at the NIVL studies, dedicated stents, 95% at one year, non-dedicated stents, 97% at one year, practically no difference. And this is a study from uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, dedicated stents patency after three years, acute DVT 81%, post-thrombotic syndrome 59%, nevals 100%. And when they compared their results to the non-dedicated stents uh, historic data, they actually found no difference at one year uh, compared to the uh, uh, dedicated stents. So wall stent may not be as bad after all. And looking at our Pittsburgh experience, we recently compared and presented them uh, uh, last week at the American Venus Forum, Don dedicated stents 123, dedicated stents 63, more frequently used in the naval cases, the dedicated stents. The number of stents we had to use in the cases that we used non-dedicated, that is wall stents, we had to use a larger, a higher number of stents, and this is because they are shorter. But other than that, uh, perioperative characteristics were very similar. Uh, we had to extend more frequently <clears throat> the wall stents into the vena cava, and this is because of the known limitation of the wall stent to, have to be weaker at the edges. The dedicated stents did not need to be extended into the vena cava. Uh, similar uh, extension rates below the guinea ligament. And uh, when we looked at the patency, 
Uh, there was no difference uh, in patency at one year for the dedicated against the non-dedicated stents. The multivariate analysis did not identify the type of stent uh, uh, as a predictor of patency. The only predictor of patency or the main one was interoperative use of IVUS, practically uh, mirroring uh, inflow disease that was identified with IVUS. So what to make out of these uh, data? Uh, I understand that there is no real midterm data to suggest that any type of stent performs better than another, old versus new, open versus closed, flexible versus rigid. Dedicated stents do not need extension into the IVC. Dedicated stents being longer require fewer stents per case, so fewer overlap zones and possibility of restenosis. Crossing the inguinal ligament is likely better with a woven or an open cell stent. However, the rate of fracture is otherwise very low. If you have good inflow, all stents will likely perform well and bad technique will always be the enemy. Thank you for your attention. Our own Dr. Garl Lakampal. He's going to be talking about pelvic venous disorder secondary to combined iliac vein stenosis and ovarian vein reflux, what to treat and when. So uh, thank you, Dr. Pappas. I have no disclosures for this uh, uh, talk. So when a patient presents uh, to um, an outside practice, I would, and what we're talking about the standard of care uh, for patients who present with pelvic venous insufficiency um, in any vascular practice, the first step always is to, of course, identify reflux and then start treating the reflux with coiling. And this is an example of a patient who's had multiple coils bilaterally in the varian vein, in the, in the branches of the internal iliac veins, the pudendal vein. And uh, again, this is a branch of the ovarian vein, which has been coiled in a lot of the obturator vein and, it, and uh, every possible refluxing vein has been coiled. And this is what still is the standard of uh, care outside. Uh, but what we do is a little different and how we evolved to got where we are. I'm just going to present our journey through that. So uh, I'm going to talk about cases, and these are the cases which eventually became data points and a part of the study that we published. So this was uh, a patient who presented to us in 2015, a 60-year-old female, Gravida 9, Para 10, and came with pelvic pain, vulvar varices, bilateral leg pain, extensive leg varices that had been ongoing for several years. And uh, this was a diagnostic venogram, uh, the iliofemoral venogram to your, uh, to your left. Um, uh, she was extensive transpelvic collaterals uh, and ascending lumbar vein, uh, haziness and flattening of the left common iliac vein. And then uh, um, the ovarian vein was selectively cannulated. And you see there's a large dilated ovarian vein with reflux and crossover of collaterals going to the uh, other side. So as was a practice when we had started doing these procedures, the patient underwent uh, chemical embolization. Uh, and you can see the images on your uh, left and then the post-chemical embolization, there was still significant amount of uh, collaterals uh, seen. Um, the patient did not have any significant improvement in her symptoms. And so she was brought back for an IVUS guided stent placement in June. And this was her IVUS. Uh, you know, she had about an 81% compression in her left common iliac pain. Um, for the interest of uh, time, I will skip. I will, you know, there you see that compression very nicely. So she underwent a 24 by 70 millimeter wall stent, which was deployed in the IVC, LCIV, sending into the LEIV. Um, and she was very regimented about, and that's the post uh, stent placement IVUS uh, pictures. And uh, the patient was very, very uh, compliant with her follow-ups. We continued to see her from 2015 up to March of uh, 2020. Uh, after that, she relocated to South Carolina and she had complete resolution of all her symptoms. We did see some uh, instant restenosis of her uh, uh, wall stent over a period of time, but she was completely asymptomatic from it and it was less than 30%. So we did not really have her uh, reintervened upon. So this formed the basis of our initial study, which is popularly known as the Santoshi study in which the iliac vein stenosis is, a, is an underdiagnosed cause of pelvic venous insufficiency. And uh, we had evaluated about 220 women who under, underwent 227 procedures for uh, pelvic pain uh, and leg pain. And what we found that 
80% of these people had uh, concomitant iliac vein stenosis and ovarian vein reflux. And, and uh, the treatment modalities were divided into embolization, embolization with stenting in a stage manner, embolization and stenting simultaneously. And then some patients opted for venoplasty alone. So what was the interesting finding which kind of changed our uh, protocol going forward was that patients uh, who presented with uh, pelvic pain and who had concomitant iliac vein stenosis and ovarian vein uh, reflux, uh, if they were treated with uh, stenting and embolization in a stage manner, had a significant improvement in their visual analog pain scores pre and post procedure. And interestingly, if they were treated with stenting alone, there was even a better improvement in their uh, visual analog pain scores. And again, you know, there was a slight difference between patients who were treated with uh, simultaneous embolization and stenting versus staged embolization and stenting, suggesting that there may be a role for uh, uh, the pelvic reservoir in patients who had this residual uh, pelvic pain. Uh, what we also found that about 10% of the patients had, complete, uh, had significant improvement in their uh, symptoms post embolization alone. So all of these ended up getting a, um, a stent placement. Now about 2015, this was, I think the first study which came out of Dr. Uh, Doherty's group in which he evaluated 19 patients with dominant pelvic symptoms and who were treated only with uh, stent placement. And uh, what he found that 15 of those 19 patients had complete resolution of the pelvic pain. Uh, 14 of these 17 patients uh, who had dyspareunia had a resolution and then uh, 13 of the 15 patients who had concomitant leg symptoms had improvement in their leg symptoms. So again, his uh, conclusion was that, you know, venous obstruction should be carefully considered and evaluated in patients presenting with pelvic congestion and treatment alone of the outflow obstruction may solve the patient's symptoms. So this led to the hypothesis, which formed the basis for our next study, which is the topic of this talk with women with combined iliac vein outflow obstruction and ovarian vein reflux will demonstrate uh, improvement in visual analog pain scores with venous stenting alone. So again, we'll start with uh, some cases. Um, this is a lady who presented uh, in, on August 13, 2020, 37 year old female, gravidus six para six, came with pelvic pain, dyspareunia and dysmenorrhea, labial varicosities for 15 years, uh, representative venogram, left iliofemoral and right iliofemoral bilateral venogram, uh, and then uh, to your right, and then the selective characterization of a ovarian vein, which seems to be pretty dilated with the uh, filling up of the pelvic collaterals, and then there's a crossover happening if you watch it uh, carefully. There's a lot of uh, bowel gas, it kind of confounds the image a little. So anyways, we demonstrated that there's reflux, and then we did an IVUS guided uh, stent placement. She had a 60% compression in her left common iliac vein, as she underwent stent placement, 16 by 120 millimeter barred Vinova stent. And this was her... Uh, uh, an image after her uh, Vinova stent was placed, and that's the IVUS post stent placement. And uh, her last follow-up was uh, 10th of uh, February, 2022 of this year. So her pre-procedure pelvic pain score was eight and can used to be zero post-procedure. This is another example, another patient, uh, 37 years old female, gravida five para three, again came with pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, Bulbar varices, and in addition, she had had a recurrent venous insufficiency, which had been treated at the Center for Vein Restoration since 2018. Uh, interestingly, she had a spine stabilization done when she was a teenager for a traumatic uh, accident. Um, again, a venogram, uh, bilateral iliofemoral venogram, and then the, the ovarian vein cannulation showing dilated ovarian vein with uh, reflux and uh, significant periuterine vein filling uh, on the left and then slowly transferring to going over to the right. So it's basically grade three reflux. So she also underwent a IVUS guided stent uh, on the 2nd of September, 2020. She had a 14 by 160 barred Vinova stent placed. Um, there was about an 84% compression in her left iliac vein. So again, the, the image uh, showing the venogram showing her stent and then the post Stent placement uh, IVUS is on the uh, left side. 
So her maximum pain, pre-pain scores were seven uh, pelvic pain scores and post-procedure, she continues to be at zero. Her last follow-up was November of uh, last year. So I wanted to include this too. Uh, is, uh, we don't see a whole lot of these patients, but we see maybe uh, a couple every, uh, every other month. 37-year-old um, female, Gravida 5, Para 4, came to us with pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, recurrent venous insufficiency ongoing for 10 years. So uh, she was referred to us for, uh, by Center for Vein Restoration for, because of her recurrent venous insufficiency. And then also uh, when we talked to her, she had been ongoing, having uh, ongoing pelvic pain, which nobody had been able to figure out. So uh, Dr. Nichols, this, he's, this is your uh, Virginia Beach patient. Okay. So she, the patient did not give us any history of uh, embolization when, she, when we interviewed her uh, during a consultation. But of course, when we did the venogram, we see all these bilateral coils in her, both her ovarian veins. And uh, when we went back and asked her, she kind of vaguely remembered that about in 2010 or so, she may have had some procedure done at one of the naval hospitals for uh, pelvic pain. So she underwent an intravascular ultrasound. 91% compression of her left common iliac vein, underwent a barred uh, 16 by 160 stent placement in her left common iliac vein. And uh, last follow-up again, November, 2021, her uh, pelvic pain scores continue to remain decreased from a maximum of eight to zero. And this is the first time ever she had a relief of her pelvic pain since 2010. So uh, the, pub, the study that we published in uh, 2021, uh, pelvic venous insufficiency secondary to iliac vein stenosis in ovarian vein reflux treated with iliac vein stenting alone. So the last three cases that I showed you was not a part of this. This is, an, uh, these are ongoing uh, cases that we are, we are accumulating data for our next follow-up study. But in this study, we had uh, retrospectively reviewed uh, 82 patients uh, who had undergone uh, treatment with the, of their uh, pelvic venous uh, insufficiency and pelvic pain with stenting alone. They, out of these, only 38 patients had had a six-month follow-up, so they were included in the analysis. And, um, you know, the, I will just cut short of what there was. 53% of these patients were Caucasian. Uh, these were the co comorbidities. Gravitas status was 2.45. The pelvic pain scores, uh, so we had divided them into dysmenorrhea, uh, and slash pelvic pain and dyspareunia slash pelvic pain and the dysmenorrhea scores were 6.86 pre-procedure and post-procedure improved to 1.7. The dyspareunia scores 4.3 pre-procedure improved to 0.41. The average area reduction by IVAS was 74%, so that was quite significant. The majority of the stents used was uh, uh, wall stents, so hence the average stent diameter was 18 and the length was uh, 94. Uh, the majority of them were uh, done was, uh, were from uh, 2000, before 2017 when we did not have the dedicated night knot stents. Uh, 32 of these stents were located in the left common iliac vein. 44% um, of these patients had a pelvic reservoir, and you know there's a breakdown as to how we kind of explain about the partial responders. 18% had reintervention rates, uh, meaning that they required reintervention of uh, going forward. So out of the patients who had nine, uh, out of the patients who had persistent symptoms, there were nine. And eight of these had uh, dysmenorrhea as their primary complaint. So dysmenorrhea is, again, something that we need to, we can, you know, it's a topic of discussion in itself. May not be the, uh, may not be just because of uh, pelvic venous insufficiency from refluxing veins or from a compressed vein, but maybe hormonal. So I think with the next study that we do, we kind of do a subgroup analysis, taking these out of the equation. Six of these patients who had dysmenorrhea as a presenting complaint had no, no improvement in this study, two had partial improvement, and one of the patients whose presenting complaint was dyspareunia had partial improvement. Uh, and one of those patients had was found to have a labral tear, so uh, that was fixed by orthopedics and her symptoms improved. These were the indications for uh, reintervention. A majority of them either had recurrence of the symptoms requiring ipsilateral extension or uh, uh, symptoms on the contralateral side requiring a contralateral uh, stent placement. 
So in conclusion, what this study showed, there was a 76% improvement, complete resolution of symptoms. Uh, so 29 out of, out of the 38 patients had complete resolution of symptoms. Uh, nine of those patients had uh, persistent symptoms, uh, partial improvement, and one had uh, no improvement at all. So our study showed that majority of women with uh, pelvic venous insufficiency secondary to combine iliac vein stenosis and ovarian vein reflux will demonstrate complete resolution of symptoms with iliac vein stenting alone. Uh, and patients who have persistent symptoms despite stenting and have a pelvic reservoir may be candidates for uh, embolization of their ovarian vein and the pelvic reservoir. And so we still consider iliac vein stenting uh, as the primary therapy in this group of women. But again, this is uh, our standard of practice. And uh, as I said, the standard of care outside still remains putting coils everywhere. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lock and Paul. Our next speaker uh, is going to Dr. Uh, BK Lal. He's going to tell us how utilizing big data, how we can use this to influence policy and reimbursement, a very important topic. And I intentionally left it for the end to hold the audience because you're going to want to hear what he has to say. This is a big topic. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is uh, um, identify some important salient features so that we can at least begin to understand uh, the important concepts uh, behind big data and how it impacts um, our decision making. Uh, I have some federal funding. I'll be discussing some of the results from some of these studies, uh, but none of them present any conflicts. So I'm going to take you back to July 20th, 2016. Um, among the many days that I've been educated, this was a very educational day for me. Uh, I was invited as an expert um, to the MedCAC. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, oftentimes uh, Medicare will convene a panel of experts to review previously existing decisions on coverage for certain procedures or review newly introduced procedures that have applied for coverage. And they convene a panel of experts, most of whom are not related to that area of specialization. Uh, they happen to be either general physicians unrelated in their clinical arena to the topic under discussion, or they happen to be epidemiologists and biostatisticians. And then there are a, a smattering of experts from within the field. Um, the question that was asked of this expert panel uh, pertained to two of the most common procedures or common categories of procedures that we perform. And those are highlighted uh, in red. One of them is chronic venous insufficiency and the other one is chronic venous obstruction. And they asked six questions of this panel of which I'm gonna focus on four. Um, the other two are less important because they failed miserably anyways. Um, so the questions that were asked were, in the opinion of the panel, based on published literature, how confident are they about the short-term, that's one question, and the long-term improvement and outcomes of patients being treated for chronic venous insufficiency. And then the same substitute short-term and long-term outcomes in chronic venous obstruction. Four questions. The panel, as is the tradition of MedCAC panels, was asked to, to grade their level of confidence from a score of one, which is abysmal, to a score of five, which is ecstatic approval. Okay. In general, just to provide you a context, you need to score at least a three to be able to earn reimbursement from Medicare. And you can see the scores that the panel gave. Essentially, three quarters of everything we do, or at least the vast bulk of what we do, scored miserably. What that means is that on the 20th of July, 2016, if we as a group collectively had approached Medicare for the first time seeking reimbursement for 
chronic venous obstruction and chronic venous insufficiency procedures, the bulk of what we do, we would probably not have received reimbursement. These were pre-existing reimbursement decisions that were being reassessed and therefore status quo was maintained. But if we had gone de novo, we would not have received reimbursement. So essentially what that means is from the time of the Greeks, 2,500 years ago till 2016, all our collective wisdom that we believe in that treatment of chronic venous insufficiency and chronic venous obstruction benefits our patients came to naught. Thank you, Peter, by the way, for that slide. I've been using it a lot, so I appreciate <laughs> your help with that one. You're welcome. And the reason is that we don't have the kind of proof that modern medicine and payers demand. That's what it boils down to. Because the panel was tasked not to make, to provide an opinion, but to provide an opinion based on established published literature. So what does that mean? We need to go back to the drawing board and understand what these kinds of panels are looking for and what they're looking at. And this is just a hierarchical pyramid of the types of studies that we see in all our publication journals, all our specialty journals. And you'll see that the base of the pyramid is broad because the number of those types of studies are more frequent. And then as the studies get tougher and tougher to convene and organize, and by tougher it means effort as well as money, you see that the number of studies reduces, okay? Also, what you see is those four brackets, which are a progressively increasing level of evidence. Note that I use the word level of evidence, not scientific value. So I am not reducing the scientific value of a case report or a case series. All I am saying is that as far as the level of evidence for or against a particular procedure in terms of decisions for coverage are determined using those criteria. And then based on the quality of the, or the level of evidence, academic societies will grade the evidence as being of great benefit, moderate benefit, weak benefit. And we're used to that, seeing those uh, categories of um, interpretations and guidelines. And MedCAC or payers will grade them according to no evidence, weak evidence, and so on and so forth. And we need to understand this. As I had alluded to, as the pyramid narrows, uh, the effort and money and time required increases to develop that kind of evidence. And that's the top, very top of the pyramid. Just to give you an example, I learned how to do one large multi-center randomized study with over 100 centers and 7,000 patients in my early career. I'm currently conducting another one of those and I'm in the planning stages of a third. That is going to be the conclusion of my career. So three randomized trials of the kind that sit on the top of the pyramid. So you can do a lot of these. Each one of these is 50 million plus price tag. Okay, so where do we get the largest bang for our buck in terms of generating data that is convincing enough to payers and particularly to the two, two big gorillas in the room, Medicare and the VA, because they are the two federal agencies that have the largest amount of influence in terms of reimbursement, which is what a lot of our other payer systems will adopt or adapt. So we have two options. We go to the second bracket from the top, which is pragmatic randomized control trials or well-designed cohort studies. Now I'll just spend one minute on pragmatic RCTs because they still take time. However, you can loosen your inclusion and exclusion criteria so that you can en enroll patients faster. You can reduce the power of the sample size. You can use surrogate outcome measures. 
and those will allow you to perform these RCTs more rapidly. However, again, they provide good enough evidence and what I would call level one and a half evidence. But in that same category, and this is what I'm gonna focus on, in our included well-designed cohort studies. And this is what has been folded into the concept of big data. So when people talk about big data, they're not talking about randomized control trials, and they're not talking about case series from a single institution, even if it happens to be several thousands of patients. We're talking about data that follows these kinds of criteria. They're being collected for, to address a focused study question. They have well-defined entry criteria for centers to participate in them. And they have well-defined criteria for patients to be entered into them. They have a predetermined sample size based on the question being asked. And perhaps you could, you could plan on enrolling a surplus so that if a secondary question uh, comes of interest, you could actually address it too. And to prevent selection bias, it needs to be by definition multi-center with a broad representation of rural, urban, academic, private, and so on and so forth. No single center should be overrepresented. Now we're very fortunate, and this is the reason why I'm talking about this particular segment of uh, big data or evidence in that we're not dealing with a low prevalence disease. We're not dealing with a low number of procedures and we're not dealing with addressing or comparing outcomes that are vanishingly infrequent, unless we're talking about EHIT or something like that. Um, but by and large, we have volume. What we don't have is an organized effort and perception and acknowledgement of what is needed. And that's what we'll talk about a little more. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how big data can be leveraged. And these are things I have done and therefore I'm familiar with and therefore I'll talk about them. The first thing to keep in mind is notice, nowhere in my definition of a good cohort study did I say they have to be several thousands of patients. So here's one example. In, in another hat that I wear, I manage the National Carotid Stenting Registry for Medicare, which is sponsored by the NIH and FDA also. And as part of that, um, at this point in time when we performed this analysis, we had collected information on 6,500 carotid stents uh, that had been performed over 100, 101 clinical centers in the country. Now, as we were looking at the data, I observed that there were several hundred procedures that were being performed through a transradial route. And when I presented the, the aggregate data, one of the companies that, that actually was very interested in pursuing this um, asked if, if I could help them in terms of obtaining FDA approval for radial artery access for carotid stenting. And so what do we do? We dug into the, the data that we had, and then we embedded a study within this registry. And within a year, we had collected enough information and we had structured an analysis that looked at comparing radial artery access and its outcomes to the rest of the cohort, transfemoral primarily. We looked at multiple outcome measures, we did essentially a propensity score matched comparison. We did a logistic regression comparison and we also compared the raw data. And we demonstrated that there was no difference in the overall outcomes between these two different approaches to performing carotid stenting. And in fact, if anything, there was a benefit in terms of access site complications as one would expect, right? In fact, we had zero. And as a result of this, they obtained uh, FDA approval. So this was something that was very readily and simply accomplished within a year. So as I said, big data doesn't have to be small, but it can be big. 
So here was another issue about, I want to say seven years ago, uh, there was a new procedure that was introduced for carotid revascularization called transcarotid artery revascularization or TCAR. Some of you may have heard about it. There's a lot of excitement. Uh, and what ended up happening was that as a result of the excitement, essentially everybody wanted to do this procedure. People that were just graduating from fellowship wanted to do it. People that were five years out of fellowship wanted to do it. People that were 25 years out of fellowship wanted to do it. All of them bringing with them different levels of experience with this procedure. And so hospitals across the country began approaching the Society for Vascular Surgery on guidance as to how to credential these individuals because everybody wanted to start doing them in their hospitals. And there was no data to guide it. And so we partnered with the company and with the society. And this was, this was a, a lot of fun doing this and convinced the company to have their clinical representatives who are present during these procedures to collect data on the indication and some metrics of the procedure and the outcome of the procedure, the in-hospital outcome of the procedure for every single TCAR ever performed worldwide. So this is the power of an academic society and a company partnering towards getting a very simple goal. All that we wanted to know was how many procedures do you need to do to become conversant in performing TCAR? A question that is very rarely quantified for procedures. But here we had an opportunity. So now we have 19,000 procedures at the point that we performed this analysis. And we knew the outcome of the first procedure of each one of 1,400 physicians who performed TCAR worldwide. The second procedure that they performed, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and you see that graph over there. So we have the adverse event rate for the first procedure of every single physician, the second, the third, and the fourth. And as you see moving to the right side of the screen, there's an inflection point at the 26th case, where the adverse event rates kind of flatten out. And so 26 procedures has become the benchmark. And as a result of that, we published the credentialing uh, guidelines uh, for that govern TCAR. So another example, here's one of a small study. This is something we're currently engaged in, we collectively because we use those same principles and we're trying to translate it and generate information. Many insurance carriers, as all of us are aware, limit coverage for chronic venous insufficiency treatment based on imperfect data. And many times they'll essentially determine that if there's no data to support it, then they won't cover it rather than data that demonstrates harm. And those are two different things. So one common example is <clears throat> that many carriers will not cover ablation for patients with GSV reflux without accompanying junctional reflux. So we decided as a group to try and address it, or at least I helped the group. And the aim here was to determine if junctional reflux impacts symptom severity in patients with isolated insufficiency of the great saphenous vein. And we were looking at comparing symptom severity and quality of life in these two groups of patients, patients with GSV, isolated GSV reflux, uh, and patients with a combination of GSV and junctional reflux. Uh, we designed it as a one-year prospective multi-center cross-sectional study. Uh, we calculated a sample size of 340 after defining confidence bounds of equivalence. And you can see the inclusion criteria. We were looking at C2 and C3 symptomatic disease. And these were the enrolling PIs. You'll recognize pretty much every, all of them. These are all high volume, high quality uh, practitioners across the country. And Chandu was leading this team and my coordinating and data management center supported it. Um, and I, I do have to thank and acknowledge Shalini's work in this as the uh, project manager. So within three months of study approval, 
We had a protocol, we had case report forms, we had an electronic data capture system set up, we had the participating clinical site selected, we had IRB and all the regulatory approvals in place, the site contracts moving forward, and the first patient was already enrolled. So that was our startup time, if we can do it right. And the study, of course, is being conducted pretty rigorously, weekly study, uh, administrative meetings, weekly enrollment newsletter. You see an example of that uh, simple newsletter to the coordinators and the PIs and a monthly steering committee meeting. How has this study been doing? This is through the pandemic. This is happening in real time. So the study started in September, at the end of September. And as you can see, there's a startup delay. The orange line demonstrates the cumulative enrollment. The blue dotted line is the ideal or target enrollment. And the enrollment was hoped to be accomplished within 12 months. So you see 340 all the way in the right upper corner. And we've been exceeding enrollment. Now we're well ahead of target enrollment rate. But we'll probably finish about three months ahead of time. And, and this is just some information. As you can imagine, we're not gonna lose statistical power by doing a premature comparison, but this gives you an idea of what the overall cohort looks like. There's a good mix of the two groups of patients in the first 100 that were enrolled. And you can see that these are patients that are symptomatic and are in trouble. So at the very least, we know we're enrolling the right kind of patients. So I wanna conclude with this thought. I think that we have to become comfortable and knowledgeable about what kind of evidence we need to present to Medicare, to the VA payer system, and of course, all the other payer systems which will either take and adapt the coverage decisions that Medicare has made or tweak it in their own way, but they're really looking for the same kind of data. And in addition to advancing the science with the types of studies that we publish, we should also be generating and engaging in this kind of work. This is relatively new to the Venus field because we have been empiric uh, in many of our decision-making processes, but we have to do it. And this is one way of organizing it. Uh, that's the kind of infrastructure needed. And of course, the jury study is doing very well. Thank you all for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Pappas himself. Um, uh, he's going to be talking about a role of anticoagulation in non-thrombotic iliac vein stenosis. Uh, clearly doesn't need any introduction. He's the director of the fellowship program at, at the Center for Vein Restoration and also is the director of research uh, across both the organizations, CVR and CVM. Very well published, very well known. So thank you, Dr. Locke and Paul. I'm also acutely aware that I'm uh, standing in the way between you and the bar, so I will get this done very quickly. So what's the goal of anticoagulation? So this is uh, one of my patients that had a non-thrombotic uh, iliac lesion that we put a stent here. And as you can see on the transabdominal ultrasound, there is evidence of instant stenosis. So the, we have no idea what the optimal way of treating this. We have no idea why this happens. We have some theories, but the feeling is that these patients should be anticoagulated. Well, what's some of the data to go for that? So one of the first studies that we did is we looked at a series of our own patients, and we just looked at the type of anticoagulants that we were putting patients on. So, so on the far right, this is one of the papers that was published by Dr. Uh, by Max Tran as the first author. And we looked at antiplatelet agents, we looked at Xeralto, we looked at Eliquis, and we looked at the patency of these stents and the early thrombosis rate and the late thrombosis rate. And we found it made absolutely no difference what you put them on whatsoever. So, and that's basically all of that. So, uh, so this was the paper that we're looking at now is that uh, this was recently published in 2021. So what we asked was, well, okay, retrospective data is good and we're looking at kind of what our patterns are, but what happens if we have a group of patients that are not anticoagulating? We compare that to a group that is anticoagulated. Again, we did this in a retrospective manner, uh, but the, still we thought that the, the, you have to do this before you do your prospective kind of questions. So we did a retrospective review of all of our patients from 2018 to 2019. The post-thrombotics were excluded. I think that's an important point to note because I do personally believe that the post-thrombotic patients do behave differently and there's a lot of data to indicate that that is the case. 
we had one group of patients that were anticoagulated and another group of patients that were not anticoagulated. And then we looked at state stent patency as assessed by transabdominal ultrasonography at three, six, 12, 18, 24 months. So this was the, the results of the groups. We had 74 patients who were in the, uh, in the um, wait a minute, this is not right. I'm sorry, that's the breakdown. So we had 270 some patients who were in the anticoagulation group, about another 70 or 80 patients who were in the non-anticoagulation group. Essentially, they were all the same except for some minor differences in like cholesterol status and ethnicity. So this is the type of anticoagulants that we were using. Uh, in the end, in the manuscript, if you look, we actually excluded the 10 patients who were on Plavix and only looked at the patients who were either on Xeralta or Eliquis. Uh, the stent locations is typically where you expect them to be. Most of them were in the left common iliac vein or the left common iliac extending into the external iliac vein. And the laterality was the same in both groups. So when you look at the stent diameters, there was a higher uh, tendency for the 16 and 18 millimeter stents uh, to be in the uh, no anticoagulation group. And then the larger stents were in the anticoagulation group. Complication rates were very, very similar. Uh, especially when you look at the stent thrombosis rate less than 30 days, which would be an early thrombosis, and then the stent thrombosis rate there is greater than 30 days, they were essentially identical and not statistically significant. And then this was the, the results by li uh, a life table analysis. There was a 98% patency in the uh, no anticoagulation group and a 94% patency in the anticoagulation group. There was, this was not statistically significant, and this was data out to one year. So it really begs the question, then why are we uh, so worried about anticoagulating these patients for non-thrombotic reason? And, and the answer is it's just fear and uncertainty. We didn't know what to do. We were early on in, in our experience, and we thought it would be better to, to be safe than to be sorry. So what are some of the reasons for stent failures, or why do we see some of these uh, intraluminal lesions or late lesions. And it's, it's really very interesting when you start to look at some of these patients because they pop up even as late as like 20 months later when you think you're out of the woods and all of a sudden you start to see some thrombus layering. So uh, my personal feeling is that this is technical issues. So if you look at this venogram here, especially on the right, you see that the stent goes from the inferior vena cava and it lands right at the bifurcation of the internal and external iliac. And you see that there is a difference in luminal diameter at the common iliac to the external iliac. So what is functionally does that do if you look at flow parameters? So thrombus layering in my opinion occurs because when you have that funneling, the lumen wants to maintain laminar flow. So when you have that difference in diameter, blood flow is directed towards the edges until the, until the lumen is reformed and you get laminar flow again. So I think that one of the reasons why we're seeing this early thrombus layering is because we're having oversizing or basically technical reasons when we're placing it. Now for the wall stents, we had to oversize these, these stents, right? 20 to 40%. You don't need to do that with the, with the newer nitinol stents. So I think we're gonna see less of this with the newer nitinol stents. But in my, this is an opinion. This is what I think that we're seeing early stent uh, thrombus layering. So I think there are other things that are also technical issues here. So again, that's the same uh, patient that I showed you before with the funneling effect. And then this is what we end up seeing when we do this on transabdominal ultrasound. Now, the real question is, when we do see this, is there a role to play in the anticoagulation? And we looked at that in that paper that we published and uh, it's a mixed bag. Some of them resolved with anticoagulation, some of them didn't, some of them were still following. So we really don't know what the role of anticoagulation is once you do get thrombus layering. So who are the at-risk groups? So if you look at a systemic review that was done, this is actually, I like this paper very much, is by uh, Ellen Dillavu, who is the senior author. They're, they review 14 papers. And the bottom line of all of this is that all of these trials, all of the papers that were written use various treatment protocols, but this review specifically focused on Coumadin use or warfarin use. So we don't know what the effects of are the DOAX on this. So what we know is that for, the, for warfarin, there's no... There's nothing that you can say that's solid as a recommendation based upon this uh, meta-analysis, or I'm sorry, this was not a meta-analysis, this was a systemic review because there was no uniformity in the trial, so they couldn't, they couldn't perform a meta-analysis on this because the data was so, uh, so poor. So who is in an at-risk group? So we recently published this paper in which we looked at women who are of childbearing age who subsequently ended up getting a stent and then became pregnant. 
So in this group, the recommendation is, and this is our personal recommendation, that by starting the second trimester, uh, they'd be started on low molecular weight heparin as prophylaxis, and then after delivery for another six weeks. And the primary reason for that is the number of, the, of patients in this group is so small, they would really don't know. Now, I will tell you that of the 15 women, uh, four of them did not get anticoagulating. They had absolutely no problem with it. The stent stayed patent. So what we were, our recommendation is until larger studies and on uh, larger volumes of patient that right now you continue to be safe and to be sorry, recommend low molecular weight heparin starting in the second trimester until we figure out whether or not this is necessary, whether or not the anticoagulation poses more harm than benefit. Post-thrombotic patients is probably where the most amount of benefit is. But again, in the post-thrombotic patients, we really don't know which anticoagulant to use. And I think this is really shown in this paper by Bill Marston, in which they found that the patients who were at risk were the hypercoagulable patients and patients that they uh, viewed as type three or type four occlusions that were recanalized. What they found was that those patients that were just started on warfarin right away had a very, very high immediate uh, thrombosis rate of up to 25% in 30 days. But the patients that they placed on low molecular weight heparin for at least three weeks that were then subsequently converted over to warfarin had a much, much lower uh, thrombosis rate in the perioperative period. Oops, I'm sorry, going the wrong way. So variables associated with stent thrombosis. Again, this came from Bill Martin's paper and, and basically it was the things that I've already told you about. So it's class four multi-level obstruction, hypercoagulable states. And in their opinion, the type of anticoagulant, it really, really mattered a great deal. So in conclusion, for non-thrombotic iliac lesions, more and more data is coming out. And we really feel strongly that it, in terms of prophylaxis for immediate post-op thrombosis, it really doesn't play a big role. When you do get thrombus layering, though, I, the, the, uh, there is no good data on it. There's no answer to it. So right now we're still anticoagulating those patients when we see thrombus layering, and uh, we're gonna uh, continue to watch those patients and hopefully publish that data later. Anticoagulation with antiplatelets or factor 10A inhibitors do not prevent thrombus layering, especially in the perioperative uh, period. For uh, women of childbearing age who have stents, we are recommending low molecular weight heparin starting in the second trimester and continuing that into six weeks uh, postpartum. And for post-thrombotic patients, it does appear that anticoagulation does play a role in preventing immediate uh, perioperative thrombosis. And the type of anticoagulation, at least from Bill's uh, one paper, does appear to matter. So thank you very much for your attention to this presentation. Thank you for coming today. We really appreciate it. We will see you next year at Vision 2023. Thank you.